So welcome, everybody, to this event, which is the first event of the 2018 Dublin Anarchist Book Fair. Uh, delighted to see so many people here to listen to Mark and hopefully ask some questions, and we look forward to a really interesting debate. Uh, my name is Moira. I'm a member of the Worker Solidarity Movement, and uh, this is Mark Bray. I think you probably know who he is but I'll just introduce him properly. So Mark is a political organiser and historian of human rights, terrorism and political radicalism in modern Europe. You can skip the degrees. Really? Yeah. Okay, fine. <laughs> okay, you can see that. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so Mark is the author of um, The Anti-Fascist Handbook, of which we have copies at the back, which is an absolutely excellent book, which I have just finished reading in its entirety, and I would highly recommend. Um, and it's there for 14.50, uh, if anyone wants to pick up a copy. Um, he's also the author of Translating Anarchy, The Anarchism of Occupy Wall Street, and Mark was involved in Occupy. Um, and he's also written The Anarchist Inquisition, Terrorism and Human Rights in Spain and France. I'm working on it. I haven't finished yet. Right, I'll get there. <laughs> Sorry. I wish that were true. I see fourth in there. <laughs> yeah, great. And so he's currently a lecturer at Dartmouth College in the US. So, um, yeah, just a quick round of applause. Thanks for coming. And then we'll, we'll basically open the floor up to questions afterwards. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah, great. If you can't, let me know. Uh, thank you, Moira, for that introduction. Thank you to uh, the Workers' Solidarity Movement for having me over on this side of the Atlantic to talk about these topics. My book came out about a year ago uh, in the context of the media uproar around Charlottesville. And I, I was sort of put in a position because of the book of explaining militant anti-fascism to the general public in the United States. I'm a historian of European history, so a lot of that was drawing upon European histories of resistance to fascism to put in American context. Today, instead, I'm gonna talk more about the context in the US recently, a little bit old stuff, and more recent stuff to put in context for you, and we can, we can take it from there. Um, forgive me if I don't have a full sense of exactly what people over here might know or not know about the US, but anything that's not clear, bring it up in the, in the Q&A. So you can't talk about white supremacy, fascism, in the United States without going back to the genocide of the indigenous population, without going back to slavery. Um, and in that sense, I think it's always important when we talk about fascism to, to take the lead of uh, theorists such as Ame Cesare and situate it within a global history of imperialism, colonialism, and genocide, and to see fascism as one variation of that. And so if you look at the context of the United States, um, you can see that these legacies are not peripheral to American history. These are American history. Uh, historians have talked about when fascism started. Uh, Robert Paxton made the argument that in a functional sense, you could make the argument that the KKK could be seen as perhaps the earliest proto-fascist uh, group. I'm not going to argue against or for or against that, but it's, you know, it's food for thought. And it's important to think of the KKK as perhaps the first example in the United States of a militant response to, to the, the, the early stages of black freedom struggles. And if you look at the history of, of active, self-proclaimed white supremacist movements in the US, when they've risen, when they've been at their most active, it has a lot to do with responses to black freedom struggles, and as well as struggles by uh, indigenous and Latinx groups as well. Um, so looking at the 1860s and 70s in the US during Reconstruction, looking at um, the, during the Civil Rights era, and so forth. Um, The legacy of the civil rights movement in the US is hard to wrap up in, in a short description, but one of the outcomes of it was that in mainstream politics in the United States, racism was no longer explicitly thought of as being okay. No politician after the civil rights movement would call themselves, or at least mainstream politicians, would call themselves racist. You have a left 
that comes out of the civil rights movement being critical of racism, and you have a right that says, no, we're not racist, the left are the real racists because they talk about race. So the right-wing response to racism becomes, don't talk about it, um, be colorblind. So in that sense, there's a contestation over who the real racists are, but both sides at least explicitly agree that to be racist is bad. And part of what's happened recently with the growth of the alt-right in the US, we'll talk about it more, is there's more and more space in the public discourse that pushes back against the notion of it being wrong to be racist. That some of these kinds of uh, discursive standards around racism being bad, that even though they were at times very superficial, that kind of govern discourse in American politics are being sort of slowly eaten away from different kind of directions. Another kind of outcome of the, the freedom struggles of the 60s and 70s is, is that as they gained success, a lot of white supremacist politics became anti-government as they saw the government supporting civil rights. And so you get the kind of uh, white supremacist insurgencies that are um, imagined in the unfortunately somewhat popular book Turner Diaries. You, you get um, the Timothy McVeigh attack on the uh, federal building in Oklahoma City. But you also get, uh, by the 1980s and 1990s, a white supremacist in politics that realizes that wearing Klan hoods or dressing like neo-Nazis maybe isn't the way forward. So for example, maybe the most important example would be David Duke, the KKK leader who starts to wear a suit and present himself differently. And so to fast forward a little bit, Donald Trump, one of his many, many, many racist moments was being pressured by a journalist to disavow David Duke and he wouldn't do it. So you have this one thread of white supremacist politics being increasingly suit and tie and insurgent, kind of this bifurcation. And on the other hand, you have uh, anti-racist politics digested by the mainstream where it's really reduced to, I think, two kinds of lessons. So the lessons that were taught in school about the civil rights movement there are a couple of chairs in the front here. I think if people in the back want to come on up and have a seat, feel free to get comfortable. Um, so the way that, that we're kind of taught about the civil rights movement in schools in the United States, about figures like Martin Luther King Jr., about Rosa Parks, is that they succeeded through the sheer brilliance of their individual example, that their kind of goodness finally shone forth in society and that they succeeded by changing hearts and minds of individuals. Erased is their role in organizations, erased is social struggle, erased is the fact that when Rosa Parks sat in the front of the bus, that wasn't the first time she had sat in the front of a bus, she wasn't the first person to sit in the front of a bus. And the kinds of lessons that are learned about nonviolent organizing are all essentially in relation to petitioning the state for rights. They're not fundamentally uh, geared from this lesson about how to deal with sometimes insurgent, sometimes anti-state white supremacists and fascist groups who are not going to listen to what the state has to say. All right, so this is just some, some food for thought that we'll draw upon moving forward. So let's talk about the alt-right. The alt-right is a term coined by the white supremacist Richard Spencer, who wanted to rebrand white supremacist politics in the United States, drawing from the European identitarian movement and other kinds of tendencies in Europe that have sought to present white supremacy not as, um, not always explicitly as a kind of conquering ideology, so much as kind of an interest group perspective among many interest groups. So in that way, they try to argue, if there can be a black power, why not a white power? If there can be a national liberation struggle for, um, in Palestine, for example, why not sort of like a white national struggle? And in that way, a lot of these white supremacists in the US try to call themselves white nationalists. And for a while, the media really bought on. Uh, a lot of media would be very reluctant to call these people essentially Nazis or white supremacists, but use this kind of white nationalist label and try to take seriously their arguments about simply being sort of an interest group acting in the interest of white people. Um, so he came up with this term alt-right to try and not only rebrand white supremacist politics about being not 
explicitly about domination so much as kind of the interest group of an allegedly marginalized and victimized whiteness, but also to try and tap into kind of um, alternative culture. So the kind of narrative that the alt-right tends to spin, especially on university campuses, is essentially the following. That you have these snowflake liberal Nazis who have victimized conservatives, victimized men, victimized white people who are sort of an endangered species and can't express themselves openly in college campuses or in major cities. And so in that way, they try to infiltrate the discourse of diversity, similar to how they try to infiltrate discourses around national liberation or anti-racist struggles, infiltrate discourses around diversity and say, if we should have diversity about having people of different backgrounds, why not diversity around people of different uh, opinions, of different politics? Among those could be white nationalist politics, among those could be misogynist politics, and so forth. The alt-right includes a wide variety of tendencies. The Proud Boys, for example, which are essentially Western chauvinist misogynists. Uh, they usually don't identify explicitly with fascism, but they have a lot of fascists within their ranks, and they've organized with fascists. What are known as incels, involuntary celibate, which is essentially just really angry men. Um, some right-wing libertarians. Um, and, and plenty of like explicit neo-Nazis and fascists. Uh, so what's getting lost in the conversation is there's, I think, an excessive focus when we look at the alt-right of groups and individuals that don't call themselves fascists and Nazis and neos, but there's plenty and arguably most of them actually do. Uh, and then there's sort of uh, what some commentators have called the alt-light, the kind of, some would say, gray area, I don't think it's really all that gray. Uh, of organizations like Turning Point USA. So Turning Point USA is interesting because it's essentially um, kind of an alt-right NGO think tank campus activism platform that tries to empower the quote-unquote embattled conservative college student to defend free market economics, free speech, allegedly American values against uh, what they call cultural Marxism on campuses. So I keep coming back to the campuses. A lot of this has to do with struggles in university context for the hearts and minds of the young intelligentsia. Um, it includes a number of other different parties that have emerged and fallen apart. Uh, Identity Europa, similar to kind of generation identity from the identitarian movement. Um, the Traditionalist Workers' Party was an attempt to sort of play upon quote-unquote left-wing fascist politics in the U.S., but they, they fell apart and their leader was involved in um, a domestic abuse scandal and so forth. So anyway, the, the alt-right is essentially this nebulous uh, conglomerate of these different kinds of tendencies that to some extent cohered around... Um, 4chan and um, uh, different internet message boards, often taking advantage of millennial meme and irony culture around Pepe the Frog, around essentially pret pretending to be a Nazi in order to get a rise out of oversensitive snowflake liberal types. But of course, the more you pretend to be something, you become that person. So. This took off and got a lot more attention as Trump started his campaign. Trump was boosted by the alt-right. Trump, in turn, boosted the alt-right uh, as it moved forward. It became more and more of a public interest aspect, along with opposition to it, around a couple of key events that you may have been uh, familiar with. The first, probably, is the punching of Richard Spencer at, on Trump's inauguration day. Get that a little. <laughs> um, January 20th, 2017. And, and that punch became its own kind of meme. I'm sure plenty of you have seen the music videos of being punched, punched in music, which are great. Um, but interestingly, on the other hand, just like all kind of public spectacles, they're subject to reinterpretation in different directions. So on the one hand, it was, it was glorified, it was shown on Saturday Night Live, it was shown on all the comedy shows. There was a, a strong, especially kind of youth support for physically confronting the far right. 
But on the other hand, a lot of commentators and pundits use this one moment as a stand-in for all of anti-fascist politics to argue that anti-fascism is simply punching Nazis. So there was one commentator that said, it's ludicrous to think that you could have stopped the Holocaust by having punched more Nazis. No one is making that argument. No one I know of has ever made that one-dimensional argument that, that this is, is all that you need to stop the far right. right? The next was the counter-protests against Milo Yiannopoulos at the University of California at Berkeley about a month, was it a month later, maybe a few weeks later, doesn't matter, early 2017. And that, even more than the Richard Spencer event, got people interested. It fired up all of the, the liberal pundits who argued that essentially, unless anti-fascists are stopped right now, free speech, as we know it, will be dead by the end of the year. <laughs> Uh, and they also argue that the, the star of Milo Yiannopoulos, people are familiar with Milo Yiannopoulos, it's a name people, yeah, I, I just, that the star of Milo Yiannopoulos will inevitably surge and, and he'll become the, the king of all media by a few years from now if we keep organizing against them. Um, I wrote an article for Salon about how that hasn't been the case, but we don't need to dwell on him. So, at this point, Antifa, and Americans say Antifa, Antifa, close enough, uh, becomes uh, uh, a media issue in a way that most Americans, and even many leftists, didn't know much of anything about anti-fascist politics prior to that. But this isn't new to North America. So go back a little bit and talk about the precedence of anti-fascist politics. So as I said at the outset, I think when talking about fascism, it's always important to situate it within broader histories of imperialism and white supremacy. And when we talk about resistance to fascism, also situate those forms of resistance within broader forms of resistance to white supremacy and imperialism, which sometimes have called themselves anti-fascist, but usually haven't. So in the United States, as long as you've had KKK groups, you've had groups that have fought back against them. Uh, as long as there have been, um, for example, Italian, Italian-American, German, German-American fascist and Nazi groups in the 20s and 30s, as well as domestic uh, fascist groups. There have been uh, groups within those immigrant communities. Uh, there have been Jewish groups that have fought back against them. Certainly the Black Panther Party was very clear in, in describing their politics as being anti-fascist and used the popular um, opposition to fascism as a lens to shine on police brutality and police occupation in African American communities and say, if you're against what the fascists did in Europe, what about what the fascist pigs are doing on our streets, right? So in that way, anti-fascist politics have, have informed a wide variety of resistance struggles in the United States for a long time. If we want to talk about the role of sort of a European-inspired militant anti-fascism, that pretty much started with uh, anti-racist action, uh, which was very explicitly modeling itself on anti-fascist action, well, to the degree that they had information, which they largely got initially through uh, punk scenes. Um, and but by the 1990s, anti-racist action in the United States had hundreds of chapters, and it became really a staple of DIY anti-authoritarian politics in the US with food not bombs and, and some other kinds of organizing. Subsequently, moving into the 2000s, uh, the anti-racist action network declined. Right now we have the Torch anti-fascist network, which is smaller, but is sort of an inheritor of that legacy that groups about, I think about 15 groups around the US. In terms of the kind of language and symbolism of anti-fascism, in the 1990s, Americans were pretty much unaware of the symbols that have now become ubiquitous that were originally designed by the German movement, the arrows, the flags behind me. If you look at anti-racist action literature in the 90s, there are other symbols, you know, smashing swastikas and so forth. But it seems in the late 2000s, there's an increasing kind of cross-pollination of language, of symbols from Europe to North America. The oldest currently existing Antifa group in the US, Rose City Antifa in Portland, Oregon, is to my knowledge the, the, the first or at least the most prominent recent group to use that language and to start to use this imagery. Uh, I interviewed one of the organizers from the group for my book and they said that they had some Europeans who were part of their group um, and some of them went and spent time in Germany so you get that increased connection. And 
over the last few years, there's been a, there's been a real desire among anti-fascists to model themselves to one extent or another on what Europeans have done. Um, interestingly, a lot of this happened before the media had any idea about what any of this meant. And so now there's a real conversation and debate in left circles about the pros and cons of using the Antifa label um, when it's useful for which kinds of political goals and so forth. And I think it's worth recognizing that especially to some extent in certain German contexts, early autonomous anti-fascist organizing was not designed around gaining mass political participation. And so when analyzing certain strains of militant anti-fascist politics, it's useful to think about different kinds of political goals because sometimes in the US context, you're examining kind of a, a small affinity group of a dozen anti-fascists who organize uh, with a very high security culture, and someone says, well, that's not a recipe for building a mass movement. Well, it's, it's not intended to be. So that's one form of politics, but there's other forms of anti-fascist organizing that have come out of the US context recently. Um, one that I'm really enthusiastic about is the example of the general defense committees of the industrial workers of the world, um, which were originally formed in the early 20th century to respond to repression, but over the last, I guess, three or four years have sort of been reimagined as uh, vehicles for a, a popular working class anti-fascism. Uh, the group that really pioneered this model came out of the Twin Cities in Minnesota. And so, for example, their General Defense Committee has um, a variety of different working groups, so one of which is an Antifa working group that researches the far right does doxing campaigns and some of the more traditional militant anti-fascist tactics, but in coalition with other groups that organize alongside Black Lives Matter, that organize alongside other community groups, and they've really built uh, an, an exciting model for popular militant anti-fascism. Another example is a network in Michigan called Solidarity and Defense. Um, a bunch of the members of the May 1st Anarchist Alliance are active in that, and again, that's sort of like a different model. So the media has focused on the example of the, the Antifa group, which stereotypically engages with the far right, wearing masks, a high security culture, often reluctant to speak to the media, but has been very resistant to look at other kinds of examples of anti-fascist organizing, like the General Defense Committees, like Solidarity and Defense. Uh, even, uh, well, they've been more interested in Redneck Revolt, so I'll talk a little bit about Redneck Revolt. Um, Redneck Revolt is a network of uh, revolutionary groups around the country that initially organized around the premise of uh, essentially reclaiming the term redneck, which, which uh, is a derogatory term for uh, working class and poor white people, uh, especially in rural areas, but originally had kind of a socialist working class orientation. So the idea was to reclaim this and to reach out to working class white populations that have been the subject of scorn from Democratic Party leaders and have usually been organizing fodder for the far right and Republican parties. Uh, to reach out and organize with them and also to try and create a left wing gun culture. So what some of these groups have done is showed up to gun shows which are usually in the exclusive propaganda breeding grounds for fascist and far right and white supremacist groups and counter recruit. And according to some of the organizers I interviewed, they've had some success in winning over militia members from, for example, the Three Percenters uh, and other kinds of uh, patriot militia groups, winning them over to Redneck Revolt. There have been interesting debates, though, about the pros and cons of the name, of whether or not some, there have been some organizers of color who have thought that it shouldn't be an effort to reclaim that term. It's an interesting and complex discussion, but that's another group. So the media in the US is generally interested if there's masks or if there's guns, and especially if there are masks and guns. But if there's no masks or guns, they're not really interested. Um, that's been my experience. So. These, yeah, masks and guns. So these kinds of groups came to the fore, even though they existed prior to the Trump era, they came to the fore through the Richard Spencer Crunch, through the Milo Yiannopoulos counter protest, and then, of course, especially in opposition to the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville 
in August of 2017 when Heather Heyer was, excuse me, murdered by a fascist. When that happened, the question of what Antifa, anti-fascism, what all this was, became for a brief period of time the number one sort of news story in the United States. And by sheer coincidence, my book came out days later. Um, and prior to the Unite the Right rally, the media narrative was very clear. It was those who militantly oppose fascists are just as bad as fascists. Uh, I imagine you've heard variations on that. Uh, and of course it really grows out of this individualistic notion that fascism can be reduced to certain kinds of illiberal tactical uh, methods rather than being a politics uh, of white supremacist authoritarianism. For about a week, that narrative was put aside because the media is so opposed to Trump that when Trump said there are good people on both sides, when he said that the tiki torch wielding Nazis around the monument, the Confederate monument in Charlottesville were simply like history enthusiasts, there was a brief period of time when the media pushed back and said no, and when even conservative politicians said, as reprehensible as I find the anti-fascists, they are no fascists, and then after a week that pretty much disappeared. Um, which is why, in my opinion, you can never count upon the mainstream media to be your friend, even if they are temporarily. Um, okay, so we covered that, we covered that, we covered that. Uh, let's talk about since the Unite the Right rally. So, um, that was a, a real moment when anti-fascism came to the fore. A lot of the left, even if there are debates over how to respond to fascism, what forms of organizing are best, what's useful, most of the American radical left essentially got on the same page about at least counter-protesting the far right, at least denying them a platform, at least saying that our communities won't allow you to promote your messages of hate and genocide. Um, that was the general perspective. Then, of course, there was a lot of pushback from liberals, but even in liberal sectors, in the context of the Trump presidency, there are a lot of liberals in the United States who are so upset and so pissed off about the growth of this explicitly white supremacist politics that they're far more sympathetic to arguments about community self-defense than they would have been in any time in my recent memory. And so it's an interesting time, I think, in American politics where the traditional political categories have been softened up. Now, if a Democrat wins the presidential election in 2020, they may harden again. They probably will, but there's a brief period of time, I think, where they softened up and conversations could be had um, with Hillary Clinton supporters about the need to defend our communities from Nazis, which I wouldn't have thought several years ago. Moving forward, the sort of public conversation about the efficacy of anti-fascist tactics revolved around looking at subsequent events and how big the far-right turnout was, because the argument coming out of Charlottesville in certain sectors was, if you counter-protest them, it only makes them bigger. If you don't allow them the opportunity to articulate themselves, then they can play the victim card and everyone will sympathize with them. So a lot of commentators from the left, myself included, have tried to look at subsequent demonstrations to show that that actually hasn't been true, that the kind of street presence of fascists, for the most part, has declined. So there have been um, some efforts to take back the streets on, the, on, the, on behalf of the far right. Unite the Right 2 rally happened uh, over the summer. They, they tried to get a permit to have it again in Charlottesville. They were denied. They had it in Washington, D.C. And something interesting happened. Um, most of the major neo-Nazi leaders in the U.S. told their followers not to attend Unite the Right 2. Andrew Anglin of the Daily Stormer, for example. Why did they tell their followers not to show up? Because the doxing campaign that came out of the first Unite the Right was so successful that it scared the shit out of them. A lot of Nazis came to Charlottesville, marched around with torches, thinking that nothing would come of it, only to go home and find that they had been fired from their jobs, disowned by their families, kicked out of their schools, and in some cases admitted that their lives had been ruined. This time around, a lot of these fascists and Nazi leaders said, look, if you show up to this and show your face, you're done. Don't bother, it's not worth it. So in the American context, certainly I'd say the most effective 
method of, of disincentivizing fascist organizing has been doxing, by far. Uh, and that's a method that I think cuts across a lot of the lines about strategies and tactics that a lot of people have, have been able to get behind. Um, that having been said, especially in the Pacific Northwest, there has still been a lot of patriot militia, far-right organizing. Patriot Prayer, for example, is one of the groups that presents itself not as being fascist or white supremacist. Uh, it has people of color members, nevertheless provides a kind of safe haven for fascist and white supremacist organizing. One of their members was uh, Jeremy Christian, who uh, murdered three people on a train in Portland, Oregon, when they were uh, defending two young Muslim women uh, back a year ago. So Patriot Prayer and Proud Boys have made an effort in Portland, Oregon, in Seattle, to establish a strong street presence. Um, I think it was maybe uh, a month or two ago they had a demonstration, and there were sort of two nodes of resistance against it. One was Rose City Antifa, uh, alongside several other collectives in the region who organized an anti-fascist black box. Um, connected to that was what was called the Pop Mob, Pop Mob standing for Popular Mobilization, which aimed to bring out a broader community response, and they brought up hundreds and hundreds of people. I don't know if the exact turned out. But both kind of coalitions supported each other, coexisted with each other, and as far as I could tell from people I spoke to and what I saw from the live stream, it seemed to go fairly well until the police uh, unprovoked shot, um, I think it was um, flashbang grenades and tear gas into the anti-fascist crowd for no reason. This seems like a room where I don't need to go into the cops and clan go hand in hand line, so I'm just going to move on. Um, that having been said, though, these groups usually can only establish themselves on the streets when they have police protection, but there have been some instances in Berkeley and the Pacific Northwest where things have gotten pretty ugly. And that's not um, a coincidence. There's a long history of white supremacy in that region, um, which you can go into in the q and if people are curious. But to, to sort of move towards a wrap-up, and then we can have a little chat and open it up, in the U.S., I think the sort of explicitly anti-fascist movement is much less important than the coverage it's gotten, meaning there's a broader anti-racist movement which draws upon organizers involved in migrant rights struggles, in uh, environmental organizing, in Black Lives Matter, that stand shoulder to shoulder with self-proclaimed anti-fascists to confront these groups on campuses, in the streets, wherever they show up, that to me is, is the real takeaway from all this politics, even if uh, the media gets hung up on the spectacle. Um, I think that there's an important role to be had for militant opposition to the far right in, in a variety of forms, but obviously, ultimately, anti-fascism needs to be about creating an alternative to fascism so that when there's an economic depression, people organize with their coworkers and neighbors rather than blaming immigrants and in that way, that's you know the, the big picture of, of anti-fascist organizing. So I'm going to leave it there. I, I, I look forward to hearing what you want to know more about in the US context particularly. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mark. That was really so much in there. And uh, having just read your book, it's just a great pleasure to hear you speaking Thank about you. it in detail. Um, so I just want to raise a couple of points, the privilege of being a chair, and then we'll open it up to the floor. Um, so there's just a few things, right, that I found uh, particularly interesting. So you mentioned that something that's happening with the rise of the alt-right, that's basically what you explained so well, is that in contrast to, um, until recently, it was basically unacceptable to be a racist on either side. Okay, so um, racism and Nazism was not an acceptable label, it was an acceptable discourse. Um, and actually, in your book, you mentioned um, how, I think it's the son of the founder of the Daily Stormer, who basically was so embarrassed or ashamed <laughs> to be associated that he has turned completely because of that stigma, essentially, right? Which is, um, and of course, the rise of the alt-right is really pushing back on the stigma of being a racist or a Nazi or whatever. Um, the other thing that I just thought was very, very interesting that you've laid out so clearly is 
the fact that the alt right, one of the their great successes is that they're basically hijacking the the narrative of diversity. Mm -hmm. So instead of a diversity of identity or different forms of oppression, but it's like a diversity of viewpoints. So this is my viewpoint. I should be entitled to it. And basically playing the victim, I think, quite a lot. So that was another thing that I just thought was extremely interesting, very precise in your analysis. And then the last thing, which I think is relevant very much to Ireland as well. So, of course, the whole issue of free speech is always related to direct action and no platforming and so on. And um, so, for example, we have there's this large event called the Web Summit, which was originally founded in Dublin. I think it's in Portugal now. But essentially, they invited Marine Le Pen to speak. And there was, you know, people picked up a fuss and then they disinvited her. And then people kept up more of us saying that her free speech was being um, curtailed. And I just think that's an interesting thing. And you know, since you've written your book, we've seen Jordan Peterson appear on the scene, who is really obviously um, normalizing these discourses of bigotry and misogyny and transphobia and homophobia <laughs> and making it very respectable. So I think I'd just love to hear what you've made of the rise of him, because he was, wasn't so big when you published your book. Um, and um, it's another interesting discourse in Europe because actually we don't really have freedom of speech in the same way as in, in, in the US. So for example in Ireland blasphemy is still a crime. <laughs> um, and obviously Holocaust denial is a crime in various parts of uh, Europe too. So it's an interesting, an interesting thing that um, freedom of speech is always being held up when there isn't, as you say in your book as well, it, actually you know, the anti-fascists are really more free speech than than, than the others. So I'll just leave it at that. If you could just mention, and then we'll open it to the floor. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you for that. So let's start with the second point about the alt right and the hijacking discourses of diversity. I mean, a lot of right wing politics in the U.S. and, and maybe maybe elsewhere is taking social justice struggles, analyzing them in a very abstract, analytical way, drained of historical content, and then using them against those struggles. So that has to do with you know, um, uh, diversity. It has to do with um, racism, um, sexism. So you know, uh, anti-sexism is reduced to just not seeing gender, or anti-racism not seeing race. And I think that, that that is connected to the question of free speech and really connected to the, the broader question of how to mobilize against the far right because in the US, I think a lot of liberals get stuck trying to play the semantic logical game with fascists when fascists are not even invested in the game. Right? It's a ruse, it's a way to create space for their politics. Um, and you know, if you look back in history, British fascists back in the 30s were making the same argument about anti-fascist infringement upon their freedom of speech. Um, obviously in different countries that plays a different role. In the US, free speech is held up as sacrosanct, even though, as I discuss in the book, there are like a hundred different ways in which free speech is limited and rendered meaningless in the US, which I'm sure it seems like folks in this room are pretty cognizant of, so I don't want to get into them. But but when it comes to free speech and this kind of analytical game, I think all too often the politics are sidelined in the interest of the question of speech, whereas to me, you need to lead in any of these conversations with the politics and with seeing fascism and Nazis and not as a difference of opinion, but as a, a political enemy to be combated by anti-racist, anti-sexist forces. Um, Anti-fascists in the U.S., it seems, are much more eager to try and make an argument about why anti-fascism is not anti-free speech. In the book, I interviewed comrades from Greece who had never even considered the question and said, well, that's a very American consideration. It's not something we think, not something we think about. And I, I enjoy sharing that anecdote with American audiences because American audiences can't fathom that there are people elsewhere who don't consider that question. So you know, it gives everyone kind of a different a different framework to look at it from. Um, in especially in continental Europe, right after World War II, a lot of communist and socialist parties in the East and West responded to the potential of a regrowth of fascism or Nazism by simply making it illegal, right. And so part of the debate in anti-fascist circles is: Do you turn to the state to stop the far right, or do you do it through direct action through community mobilization? Most Americans are unaware of that debate. And so in the US, the debate occurs essentially between 
anarchists and civil libertarians, neither side is interested in talking to the state. Right? Civil libertarians want what they imagine as entirely free speech. Anarchists want to stop the fascists without turning to the police or the courts. So in that sense, that, that dynamic is, is usually, it's an option that is not even considered in the conversation. Um, when it comes to people like Jordan Peterson, when it comes to um, like uh, Charlie Kirk, Ben Shapiro, I'm not sure if any of these names ring a bell, they have this very kind of misogynist, logical, enlightenment, uh, really ag aggressively white dude, uh, a way of being, um, that attempt this, the argument is that essentially the left is illogical, emotional, irrational, and they sort of very, you know, in a very kind of macho way say, I will slice you with my logic. <laughs> and of course the way they do this is trying to abstract into the analytical and, and retreat into this free, free speech notion. Um, Derek Black, yes, the son of the founder of one of the neo-Nazis, the Stormfront of the Daily Stormer, forgive me if I forget which is which, but Stormfront, yeah. Uh, the son of the founder of Stormfront was groomed to be the next white supremacist uh, savior. He went to an, a liberal arts college and long story short, by virtue of uh, befriending a bunch of Jewish students, ended up uh, giving up these politics. And so, one, that's great. Two, it's not a model for how we stop fascism. <laughs> right? Because there are not enough people to do that work, nor should those people have to do that work. But, as opposed to sort of, I think, the liberal interpretation, which is you see if you just try hard enough you can win over anyone, which is demonstrably not true, I, I argue that it's an example of how even if you situate your framework within the hearts and minds perspective, even if you take that position, hearts and minds are changed in the context of discourses of power. If most of the students at that college had been Nazis, he wouldn't have changed his mind. Right, he changed his mind because he was ashamed because when he went on his, his dad's podcast, he'd have to hide himself away in his room and not let anyone know what he was doing. He didn't say who he was. And that kind of context of taboo and shame and rejection was the context in which he changed his mind. So that's, I think, it has in my experience, because a lot of what I've done over the past year is given these presentations to, to audiences that are a lot more skeptical than you folks. And, and that seems to be a useful way to talk about it. But I want to hear what people here want to talk about. Great. So, Constantina, do you have the microphone? Hello. So I assume you follow the career of Richard Spencer quite closely then. Has he sort of retired? I was wondering if you have an update. I'll, I'll tell you why I asked. The last time I heard from him in the video, he more or less admitted that the whole freedom of speech stick that they use is just a recruiting tool. And once they gain power, they'll shut it down. Yeah. 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 And after that, I never heard from him again. Right. That, that, that sounds like somebody saying, I give up, I retire, I'm out. Well, there, there is a video of Richard Spencer practically weeping, saying Antifa is winning. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so he's, he's just a loser now. Is he going Well, or? he's always been on this way. So, Spencer had a window when he was given some public attention. Um, there was a CNN program, um, <coughs> United Shades of America um, that did a sort of extended interview with him on CNN. There was a window of time when he was doing uh, campus presentations. Uh, there were some campuses that attempted to cancel his presentation, but they legally couldn't always. Obviously, they're counter-protests. Um, he seems to have essentially given up on trying to do public presentations after he was punched. He also did some videos explaining how now, if he ever wants to do anything in public, he needs to like hire security. And so the kind of financial aspect of it is also important, not to mention that, of course, a lot of fascists and, and Nazis try to project the, this street power, which if, if they can't project that as part of their appeal. Yeah, he, he's not given the time of day in a mainstream way anymore. Uh, I should tell you, yeah. he's also in the Irish Times here, given a full page spread yeah. about the dapper white nationalists uh, right. and 
haven't picked up an Irish time since, but you know, it's <laughs> right. Also in the U.S., there were similar profiles of him and other people that focused on you know the attire rather than the, the yeah, heinous yeah. politics. He's got beautiful furniture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and it's funny though, because to some extent that works both ways. There have also been profiles of anti-fascists simply focusing on their clothing, and so then the right complains about that. So I mean, it is, you know, a statement both ways on the vapid nature of the media. But anyway, he, he's not really doing any more campus presentations. He really had this campus strategy; it's fallen apart. You're right that he, he and others try to win over potential recruits through things like freedom of speech because they try to appeal to American values and then sort of once they get them in, well, the real kind of patriot recognizes that, you know, this country's under siege by immigrants, that Muslims are destroying our way of life, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Uh, thank you. Yeah. So there's somebody right there. I, uh, well, one of the first things, I, I don't want to be that guy, but I had a few things I wanted to say. Go for it. Um, well, the first was what you mentioned, how uh, Richard Spencer wasn't was an actual believer in, in freedom of speech, but was using it as a kind of a, an excuse to say whatever. I mean, there's a great Albert Camus quote, I think, where he specifically states that you cannot ever trust the anti-Semite when because the anti-Semite knows exactly what they're trying to say, and they're trying to. I forget what the exact quote is, but it's if you can look it up, anybody, it's that they use basically any, any bit of rhetoric at their disposal to just basically, you know, go as far as they can. And at the moment they're pushed back, they say, oh, we're just kidding or we're joking. I mean, they're not, but that's the amount of possible deniability to try to say. Um, the other thing I want, one of the other things I want to say is also, I mean, mentioning Jordan Peterson, I have to say, um, I'm, I don't know if there's any other Canadians in here, but I just want to remind you that even Canada, we do not have absolute freedom of speech. I mean, that's, it's one of those beliefs that creeps over the border, much like a bunch of other right-wing Republican beliefs. And if you've seen the way our conservative party has been handling itself in the past 20 years, you'd see it. But um, again, so like I said, Jordan Peterson alone talking about that kind of stuff is, is still being mired in the American context, even though that kind of stuff that shouldn't exist in Canada. Yeah. So I really have to wonder where he got, got that. I mean, he was... He rose to prominence fighting against Bill C-51, which he kept saying would uh, criminalize anyone who would misgender someone. And all that was was just adding transgender identity towards the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms as a protected class, which, by the way, was already a protected class under the provincial law, which if he had done that, he would have been arrested even before the federal one passed. Thank you. Um, yeah, Canadian Canada has produced its fair share of these alt-right figures. I, I still have no idea where they come from, but we have them. Yeah, it's true. It's true. And, and you can't blame it all on Alberta. And for those of you who are unaware, um, Alberta is has been referred to multiple times as Canada's Texas for 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 multiple reasons, and I don't just mean because there's oil and cattle there. And then also the notion of kind of just joking is really important to this. Um, Milo Yiannopoulos always falls back upon, I'm, I'm just joking, Alex Jones claims to be playing a character. And so there, part of the game is also to try and get a rise out of the left who will get, according to this alt-right vision, so over carried away that they make sort of a fools of themselves, whereas this sort of recourse to, to some kind of nihilism is the springboard towards these kind of politics. Um, yeah, and, and it's also worth remembering that, um, you know, ultimately fascists historically have been willing to discard almost any principle at a whim based on their sort of political machinations and that I think it's debatable whether fascism is even a political ideology, but um, we don't need to get into that. Well, I mean, you don't really define it as an ideology of violence. But... Yeah, it depends on how you define ideology. Yeah. Anyway, the, you get what I'm getting at. <laughs> Well, I'm sorry, I forgot. One other thing I want to say is, I don't know if you've ever heard of the quote by the outlier who was Richard Nixon, lady, one of his former campaign strategists. There's a great quote where he talked about being interviewed after Richard Nixon, I forget if it was after Richard Nixon left office or while he was still in office, and he talked about how by 1954 you couldn't just get elected by using the N-word, but you had to couch it in other terms like forced integration or busing or all that other stuff, and it's a great quote. Yeah, you know, right. Up. Of course, yeah. Yes. Some in the front, some Joseph, in the back. John Joseph. Yes. 
Hi, um, I was wondering about the influence of the Christian right in uh, the US. I hear a lot of murmurings, say particularly about the evangelical movement and you know, with Mike Pence and everything. I was wondering how influential they are. And I was also wondering how do they interact with the alt-right because it seems like such a clash. Like the alt-right gained so much traction by being countercultural and you know, transgressive, which is very contradictory to you know, traditional Christian fascism, you know, like uh, traditional societal norms and that. Yeah. Kind of thing. <clears throat> Good, good question. Um, so, oh, okay, sure. Um, so there's a lot. So again, the alt right isn't a very discrete entity, right? There's a lot of different influences and tendencies, and a lot of these influences and tendencies coexist with other kinds of groups. There's a lot of kind of areas of overlap. So a lot of people that are brought into alt right circles. Uh, you know, come in based on beliefs in free speech, beliefs in kind of um, a traditional America that's being eroded that they imagine as being patriar patriarchal and white and Christian. Um, you know, there's overlapping issues around uh, pro-life pro politics and so forth. But it's not, uh, you know, the, the tra traditional Christian right still exists and is not synonymous with the alt-right. And so you mentioned Pence as a good example. If Trump were to be impeached, which I don't think will happen, um, having a Mike Pence would be arguably worse. Depends on how you look at it. But in that sense, you know, you don't need an alt-right for there already to be kind of a fascism in the US, in that sense, right? It sort of it seems like where you're getting at it. Um, but the Christian right is not as interested in kind of having um, uh, a kind of from outside in kind of almost insurgent far-right politics, because they're very well established and entrenched, but they too also feel embattled by changes in the country about uh, gay marriage, about transgender rights, and so forth. So they, I think there's kind of an overlapping, but it's not syn synonymous, and they certainly wouldn't go along with a lot of uh, the alt-right talking points. But um, again, I'm more of a scholar and historian of the left, and so the books about left responses to the right, there are, I know, plenty of people who could answer that question better than I could. So. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, first of all, well, Mark, I just want to thank you for a very insightful discussion. It was very, very interesting. My question, um, I suppose I have two parts. First of all, um, I mean, the rise of the alt-right in the States, would you exclusively put this down to the rise of Donald Trump? I mean, the effect of Donald Trump on the, on the, on, in terms of that, the whole discourse? And secondly, there seems to be in America at the moment, by the mainstream media, a kind of a concerted effort to get rid of Trump or almost possibly get him impeached. And what would be your thoughts of a post-America Trump if that was to be the case? I mean, I would argue that the backlash could actually be worse in terms of the reaction. So just to get your thoughts on that, what do you think maybe the situation? Yeah. Um, so, so no, I don't think you can, you can simply ascribe the alt-right to Trump. Certainly the alt-right got a lot more attention because of Trump. The alt-right helped to put Trump in office, but they're related but distinct factors. The alt-right was already growing and would continue to grow, and I think is a response to a kind of white backlash against perceived destruction of traditional America in a variety of different ways. Um, and a lot having to do with uh, you know contestations over um, culture wars on campuses and so forth. Right now, the kind of political cachet of the term alt right is is not very strong. So there was a while when the media would entertain the alt right as sort of one of the many positions to be considered in American politics. But now I think that anti racist movements have been successful in saying that's just basically the same as Nazi. Cut it out. Um, in terms of what the country would look like without Trump, certainly I think some of these groups and individuals who really support Trump would essentially buy into the notion of, uh, you know, the notion of the deep state that is talked about a lot in, in American right-wing politics that they're, as Trump describes them, these unelected, behind-the-scenes career bureaucrats who are really pulling the strings. And if he were to be impeached, uh, a lot of these groups would say, well, you know, there goes American democracy. These groups that we hate are... Uh, we're under siege, and we need to organize, and it could in, in, uh, they could feel kind of emboldened to be more dangerous and more, more violent. That having been said, though, a lot of right-wing groups in the U.S. 
when it comes to like direct action of street politics are fairly lazy or cowardly. So I think that it could embolden individuals and small groups to do really dangerous things. I don't think it would result in an actual kind of mass fascist street presence. Um, but I think the bigger question is whether or not Trump stays, whether or not he gets reelected, is what will right-wing politics look like in the U.S. in 20 or 30 years? When a lot of these cultural changes and demographic changes that the far right is freaked out about really take hold, and when the majority of the country is non-white, uh, when increasing percentages of the country are non-Christian, right-wing politics seemingly, if it wants to hold on to power, will have to change. And that was the, the takeaway that the Republican Party had from uh, their losses to Obama in the last two presidential elections. There were reports thrown up saying, we need to do more to reach out to these different demographics. And then Trump came along and then just threw that report in the garbage. So will the Republican Party be able to respond to what will right-wing politics look like that? And what will explicitly white supremacists and fascist politics look like in a country where a smaller and smaller percentage of the population would be sympathetic, but those who would be sympathetic feel more and more embattled and threatened? Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dangerous mix, and I'm not sure what it'll look like. So um, my question is more related to anti-fascism uh, than kind of alt-right, but I, I, I don't know how much you might know about it, but if you can, do you think there will be a change of tactics uh, since the Occupy ICE movement uh, in Portland won, which won a lot of support from, say, local government? Um, and it was really federal government which was pushing very heavily for, for them to be cleared out where they were actually winning support mm -hmm. from the mayor and a lot of local police as well even work on the side of them, which is unlikely. But do you think this is a changing of kind of anti-fascist tactics or an evolving of anti-fascist tactics in the U.S.? Sure. So uh, for those who don't know, um, ICE is the... Um, anti-immigrant uh, border control deportation force in the U.S. Um, and especially with Trump, liberal and left-wing sentiment against ICE has really surged. Uh, one of the most important mo moments, of course, was the, um, the decision to separate migrant families and create concentration camps for children. I can't believe I have to say that. So. Because of that, the, the sort of slogan of abolish I speak gained a mainstream appeal and really started to divide the Democratic Party between establishment folks who said this is unrealistic and sort of more uh, left-wing progressive folks who unfortunately really what they meant was not abolish ICE but let's create a different agency that does the same thing with a different name to score political points. Anyway. I digress. Um, so the, the kind of the street response to this what were some of these occupations, most notably in Portland, Oregon, where there was an occupation in front of an ice station that that um, uh, blocked the entrance. There were also similar actions in New York and elsewhere, and they did gain a, a certain amount of public uh, support. Tomorrow at the Anarchist Book Fair, I'm going to be doing an interview about Occupy Wall Street, its legacies and influences. That's one of the things we can talk about if you, you should come on out. Um, as far as tactics and strategies of resistance, I mean, I, I wouldn't specifically describe it as an anti-fascist action per se, although in a broader sense, of course, it is. But you know, most of the people doing this kind of work aren't part of explicitly anti-fascist groups. It's, I would say, more of a kind of broader direct action left form of resistance. But, over the past decade in the U.S., that kind of resistance, whether it's occupying police stations through Black Lives Matter, whether it's Standing Rock, whether it you know, has become really central and important, what's interesting is the public sympathy around it is very much contingent on sort of where the wind's blowing in terms of national politics. Although under the Obama administration, many, many, many people were deported, it's, it's a problem when Trump deports people, if his successor is a Democrat, maybe sympathy for an action like that will disappear. If somehow ICE is abolished and it's reimagined under a new name and there's an occupation, then maybe it won't have the same sympathy. So not to be too pessimistic, but you know how it can work based on what, what kind of sympathies are at play. But uh, yeah, I would say that it is broader, part of this broader kind of direct action politics, anti-fascism in the US being one thread of it. Yeah, thank you.
Hi. Uh, you said the kind of mainstream media could be your friend right up until it isn't. I was wondering um, the way that the American like giant news corporations would talk about um, fascism and the kind of sunlight is the best disinfectant idea. Is it best to do your anti-fascism on a giant public platform like that? Or does it do more harm than good? Sure. So um, just to talk a little bit about this notion of sunlight is the best disinfectant. There is this almost um, mythical notion um, in, in the American popular discourse that the way that fascist or white supremacist ideas are stopped is allowing them to grow. Um, and never ever is there an attempt to look at historical fascist and white supremacist movements, look at the way they've grown by holding public meetings, by printing newspapers, by in embedding themselves in communities and saying, okay, how can we stop that from happening? And what role does discourse play or not play in that? Um, to go back to Miley Yiannopoulos, to go back to Richard Spencer, to go back to strategies of resistance to fascism in general, there were hundreds and hundreds of think pieces written about how this was not probably counterproductive, but necessarily, logically, analytically, has to be counterproductive because there was this sort of faith in the notion of trying to suppress, this notion that trying to suppress, <coughs> notion that trying to suppress the far right would inevitably do this. Um, but it hasn't been the case. Miley Yiannopoulos has fallen apart. Richard Spencer has fallen apart. And the media have actually gotten so disinterested in the question, they're not even interested in following up on the question. Like, I was speaking to some comrades earlier about how a month ago, two months ago, there were literal street battles in Portland, Oregon, between fascists and anti-fascists. Outside of local media, no one cared. Because everything goes in these little cycles. Um, sorry, I forgot what your question was. Media, media and what? Like, does it do more harm? Oh, than oh in terms of methods of, of anti-fascist yeah. resistance. Um, <laughs> I think that there's a time and a place for a wide variety of anti-fascist organizing forms. My general shtick, if you will, is I, I refrain from saying that there is one way to fight fascism because there is no one way to fight fascism. I consider my book a kind of menu. People can look at the menu and decide what they want to eat based on what they're in the mood for and what their context is. I think all forms of organizing have to be based on context. That having been said, though, as a broad movement, there has to be some way to engage uh, larger populations in struggle. And uh, chapter three in my book looks at the, the rise, which I'm sure you all are familiar with uh, far too much, the rise of sort of quote unquote mainstream far right parties <coughs> in, in a lot of different countries and has quotes from anti-fascists about saying, okay, some of our old strategies don't, aren't gonna work against these parties that are in parliament. So when you also, of course, factor into the notion that ultimately, as long as we have capitalism and patriarchy and, and racism, there's always going to be space for fascism to grow. You need, of course, to, to really have a profound social transformation to be able to say never again. You need the broad kind of organizing. That having been said, though, I think that small affinity groups can accomplish a lot under the right circumstances. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm a supporter of a broad range of anti-fascist methods. Hi. Um, so I was involved in um, ARA, the anti-racist action in North Carolina in the late 90s, um, early 2000s. And um, something that was always apparent or something that we always debated and ultimately a lot of us people of color ended up leaving, but was you know the, the role of ARA in terms of communities of color, and because ARA was largely white, middle class, college educated um, anarchists, um, and then those of us who were not that, um, we were accountable to our own communities. And so then how was our participation um, accountable, like how was ARA ultimately accountable to um, most affected communities? And that's a conversation that I've tried to have here with uh, loads of different 
um, groups, and it doesn't seem to be part of the discourse. So, uh, like, could you do you have examples of models where there is that? Um, so I'll try. I'll try. Oh, okay. Well, you're so quick on it then. <laughs> Um, that is a conversation that seems to be happening across the U.S. Um, there is a perception that anti-fascist groups are overwhelmingly white. Probably in some cases that's true, probably in some cases it's not. There's no actual data, but the, the, but less, the question of whether that's true is, is less important than the fact that there is a perception that it's true and that that can really create a, a, an impression that communities of color have for these kinds of groups. Um, in general, of course, a lot of anarchist and radical politics in different times and places in the US can be predominantly white. And the way that a lot of these groups interact with communities they're trying to work with has been very, has been awful, right? Has been awful. That's been true of ARA groups. It's been true of any kind of group. In terms of examples of how to do it better, one would be the, uh, that comes to mind, is the organizing that led up to the counter protests against the Unite the Right to right, Unite the Right One in Charlottesville in August of 2017? So I interviewed some of the anti-fascists who were involved with that, and they um, were part of a coalition with uh, anarchist people of color, with uh, Black Lives Matter, with Surge, which is a largely white liberal um, anti-racist group, with a uh, University of Virginia campus environmental group, and. Um, they described it as a, as a, a fruitful collaboration where um, a lot of community decisions were made about what the protest would look like. So for example, there was a discussion about whether or not to organize a black bloc. And interestingly enough, the ones that were most in favor of it were Surge, were the, the liberal anti-racists, in part coming from a perspective that we as white people should put our bodies on the line to confront the far right. And the other groups were uh, against it, so it didn't happen. Another question was whether or not to show up with firearms to bring guns, because it's an open carry state. And um, you know there was debate back and forth and ended up not doing it. It's an example of coalition building. I'm sure that it, too, had its problems. Um, it, it's part of the larger question, which is not easy to hash out in the US, of what is the role of white anti-racists? Um, and there's a range of perspectives on that. Uh, it's not for me to solve that question. But the question of whether, of what solidarity looks like, what collaboration looks like, um, what the role of a sort of specifically white anti-racist organization could be. So for example, in the 1980s, there was a group called the John Brown Anti-Klan Committee, which came out of some of the legacies of the Weather Underground and other groups that was sort of, a, in some ways, kind of a precursor to anti-racist action. And actually, there's a writer in California who's writing a history of it. It should come out soon. It's very interesting. Um, and I did a presentation with some of those um, organizers last year in San Francisco, and some organizers of color pushed back against the notion that there should be a specifically white anti-racist organization. I've heard other organizers of color say white people need to do as much as they can to push back against white supremacists. It shouldn't fall on the on people of color to do it. I see all the different perspectives. It's, it's a not an easy thing to, to hash out, but it has to be part of the consideration. I will say, though, that, it, it, that in the United States, there does seem to be especially a very significant participation uh, from queer, trans, and non-binary people in anti-fascist uh, anti organizing, and that is frequently left out of the broader conversation around who is resisting and why and who's uh, under threat. Um, in Rochester, New York, there was um, a queer and trans gun club created called Trigger Warning. I'm not sure if that means the same. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a pun. Yeah, pretty, pretty clever. Um, and uh, in response to a lot of um, homophobic and transphobic uh, violence in the city, um, but yeah, uh, it, it is something that's very much at the center of American radical politics, which doesn't mean that, it, that people usually get it right, but it's, it's there. Hi. Hello. Um, let's see if this thing is dying or still working. Uh, I wanted to ask a question specifically about <clears throat> what's new about the alt-right. Obviously, there's elements of continuity and change. Um, 
you know, it was important politically for us to push back against the media narrative and go like, no, it's the same old Nazis, really, because in majority it is. But there do seem to be elements that pretty much everyone has picked up on, and yet I haven't really seen a, um, a satisfying explanation of, which is the, the newly virulent misogyny, if you like, element within the right. Obviously, the Nazis were always patriarchal and misogynist, but they would... Um, you know, most of them would have rather died, if, of the Nazis that we were confronting back in the 80s and 90s, would have rather died than like publicly admitted that they couldn't get a girlfriend or something like that. It would have wounded their macho pride. So something like the incel does, culture seems to be completely disconnected to the Nazis that we knew from the sort of football hooligan side of things back in the 80s and 90s. But, and I know everyone has picked up on this, but I've yet to see someone actually nail it, so I was just wondering in case you managed to uh, come across <laughs> an interesting uh, take on that. Yeah, um, well, I don't want to get expectations too high, but I'll, I'll say a few things. Um, well, first, in terms of the question of should we call the all, simply just call the alt-right Nazis, um, I understand the utility in trying to poke holes in the alt-right, which was originally coined as a label to try and rebrand far-right politics. But I was convinced by the argument made by Matthew Lyons, who's a writer who, am I breaking up? Mm -hmm. Matthew Lyons, who's a writer who's written about far-right politics, who said, we can't assume that far-right politics will never change. And if we try to say that every manifestation of far-right politics is fascism or Nazism in the way that it was in the 30s, we're not going to be ready for how it changes. And as I discuss in the book, I think part of the, one of the main mistakes made by the European left in the, in the 20s into the early 30s was not recognizing how fascism and Nazism were different from traditional reactionary politics uh, and that necessitated different forms of resistance. So I do think it is important to be very sensitive to how far-right politics have changed and not simply to say a Nazi is a Nazi is a Nazi is a Nazi. That having been said, what makes the alt-right different? Um, I think that any kind of fascist or far-right politics should be understood as a kind of reaction, and you can understand the reaction in terms of what it's reacting to. So in, in the context of the US, uh, certainly it needs to be understood as reacting to what the far-right perceives as the kind of hegemony of liberal snowflake cultural Marxist <laughs> politics in certain spheres of life around um, feminism, around queer and trans politics, around anti-racism, around marginalizing what these groups view as truth, as free speech, as masculinity, fill in the blank, right? And I think it grows up in, in a context, uh, you have to understand in terms of the role of different kinds of media, that's been true of far-right politics all along, but internet culture, meme culture, irony, sarcasm are very central to it. Um, and trying to essentially win people over primarily based on their antagonism of feeling marginalized from the left, of feeling like as a, a straight cis white man, you are victimized, you are uh, you know, a second class citizen, what have you. and and you know, building off of that. As I said, and this is only half a cop-out, I'm not specifically a scholar of right-wing politics. That's the best I have for you, but there's plenty of people who are writing about it who would do a better job uh, answering that question than I would. But that, that, those are my thoughts. Thanks. And just getting back to the uh, mainstream media, I, I think the mainstream media in this country they treat us like mushrooms. They feed us on bullshit and keep us in the dark. <laughs> there's, there's hardly, like they told the, the Zionist neo-Nazi party line on what's happening in Palestine. And as regards the, the war crimes being committed in Yemen, we're just getting the US back to Saudi line on that one. The, even the sports news is crap, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Earlier this month, Irish motorcycle races swept the boards at the Manx Grand Prix. Wasn't even mentioned on RTE. Yeah, apparently, uh, what's his name, uh, Norris won the won the Hockey World Cup, you know? But uh, apart from the, the uh, mainstream media trying to just keep us in the dark, 
Um, what bothers me, like, I, I was never a genius at school now, but the, the one subject I did love was history. And uh, looking at what's happening throughout Europe now with the countries uh, becoming uh, more right-wing and anti-immigrant and that kind of thing, it just reminds me of the, kind of the lead up to World War II, you know, what, what happened there, the same sort of crap going on then, you know. Now, having said that, there are certain immigrants I have a problem with. It's not your ordinary Joe so it's the companies who come over here making millions and, you know, supposedly giving employment. They're giving jobs here that are barely above the minimum wage, but they're making millions out of it. And hand in hand, the government are then saying, oh yeah, we're cutting down on unemployment and all that. They're the type of immigrants I have a, a problem with, you know, not your your ordinary people coming over here for a better life. Like I work with a lot of um, people from uh, Africa, and uh, like I have to say that that term, person of colour, annoys me. I think it's one of these politically correct nonsense terms that say uh, no, I was a trade union activist for years, and the politically correct crowd, they ruined the power of the unions. I have spoken to a number of my uh, African colleagues, and I've asked them how they feel about being called a person of colour. Um, one guy said, I, I said to him, like, would you prefer to be called a, a black guy or a person of colour? One, one guy said, technically he was dark brown, but they all were in unison, said they don't want any of that politically correct bullshit, call me a black dude, you know? So I think, certainly the, you know, the reaction to uh, fascism, so, sometimes we're, we're shooting ourselves in the foot. I think we need to be stronger about it, you know? And uh, as I say, the mainstream media are really uh, playing into the hands of the fascists. Okay, thank you. Sure, a lot, a lot there, a lot there to be addressed. Uh, let me just uh, say a few words. Uh, I think in terms of the term person of color, I think with any kind of racial term, it's important to understand it in terms of its context and why people in the United States use the term is to emphasize the shared experience of being a non-white person in a white supremacist society. If other people in other parts of the world have different language to talk about that, that's, I think, that's fine, that's up to them, right? But I think it's important to understand the context of, that it plays in the United States. In terms of the similarities or differences of Europe today versus the 30s, I'm, I, I think it's, it's important to be concerned in the same way that people should have been concerned back then. I'm not a huge fan of drawing sort of one-dimensional parallels between drastically different times, but there are, uh, there are some concerning similarities that we should be organizing as if it could be the 1930s, whether or not it is. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, I think we might wrap it up because it's 20 past nine. We have to be out here by 9.30. So I just want to say thank you very much to thank Mark. You. And it was a great pleasure. And thanks for everyone.